All right, live stream is rolling at this time. Will all sergeants please start their recordings? According to PT, all set. Thank you. Cloud recording is up. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, would all panelists please turn on, turn on their videos for verification purposes. To minimize any disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Levin, we are ready to begin. Chair, I'm sorry, you're on mute. I'm gonna unmute you now. Thank you very much, uh, Sergeant. Um, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to this hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare today. The committee will conduct a hearing on a series of bills related to improving administration and access to social services for vulnerable populations in New York City. It is my hope that this legislation introduced by myself and many of my colleagues honors the lived experience of those closest to these issues and for whom these services affect on a daily basis. I'm proud to introduce, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a proud to sponsor intro 2405, which would expand eligibility to runaway and homeless youth for rental assistance programs by allowing their time spent in an RHY shelter to count towards eligibility for city fest vouchers. This bill would also preclude DSS from requiring youth to live outside of a youth shelter as a condition of eligibility. It is my intention that this bill will help young people facing homelessness to more swiftly and easily secure housing for young people to avoid prolonged stays in multiple systems to get the help that they need. The next two bills, which I also sponsor, will shine a light on the foster care system to ensure that children are in appropriate placements. Intro 2419 would require ACS to do quarterly reporting of time spent in the children's center or temporary placement facilities. Intro 2420 would require ACS to conduct quarterly audits of foster care placements, placement notifications to ensure that a child's attorney is notified of their placement in a timely manner as required by state law. We must make certain that children are languishing in facilities that are meant to be temporary and that attorneys always know where their clients are to effectively advocate for, on their behalf. Intro 1304, sponsored by council member Daniel Drum, would authorize council members and, public, and the public advocate to visit and inspect detention facilities administered by ACS. A critical function of the New York City Council is to serve as an oversight body for city policy and services. Elected officials cannot effectively investigate and legislate on behalf of the public and those served by city agencies if those facilities are not available. Intro 1992, sponsored by council member Diane Ayala would establish a pilot program within ACS to train a small percentage of ACS caseworkers to specialize in developmental, intellectual, and physical disabilities. Intro 2379, sponsored by Council Member Dharma Diaz, required DSS to establish a domestic violence shelter exclusively for individuals who identify as male. And intro 1829, sponsored as well by Council Member Diane Ayala, would preclude. DHS from requiring a child's presence at an intake center when a family with children applies for shelter. The practice of requiring children to be present at PATH has been suspended during the, for the duration of the pandemic, and this has been a welcome change. There is no practical reason to have children in attendance, and it is unfair and burdensome to families to revert back to this policy. Children whose families are applying for assistance from the city should be able to remain in their schools and at their activities as their peers would be. I wanna thank advocates and members of the public who are joining us today. I wanna to thank representatives from the administration for joining us and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. At this time, I would like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues who are here this morning. Uh, we're joined by, um, let's see. Um, 
through the attendance. Councilmember Barry Grudenchik is here. Councilmember Dharma Diaz is here. Councilmember Antonio Reynoso is here. And we expect to be joined by other council members throughout the course of the hearing. I'd also like to thank um, my staff, Jonathan Boucher, uh, Chief of Staff, my co-legislative directors, Elizabeth Adams and Nicole Hunt, as well as committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, Crystal Pond, Aminta Kilowan Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omari, Policy Analyst, Julia Haramis, Financial Analyst, and Daniel Krupp, Financial Analyst. And with that, I'll turn it over to any of my colleagues that um, are sponsoring legislation that wish uh, to make an opening remark. Uh, Council Member Diaz, do you wish to do that? You're still on mute. Am I, can you hear me now? They, yes, I can. Yeah. Good, good morning. Good morning to my colleagues that are in attendance and also to the panelists here today and to DSS staff. I am Dawn Vanessa Diaz, Councilwoman in the 37th Councilmatic District. I am also a former employee of a homeless shelter in, in Brooklyn. Between becoming a member and being on staff, I realized that there are no domestic violence shelters for men which I find to be a great detriment to, to our process in, in trying to assure that we house individuals appropriately. And I also have found the need for specific services to men that are distraught and dealing with domestic violence. I'm eager to hear from DSS this, this morning and looking forward to positive outcomes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Diaz. With that, I'll turn it over to Aminta Kilowan, who's committee, uh, counsel, counsel to the committee um, to administer the oath to the administration. I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Chair Levin. My name is Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the Committee on General Welfare at the New York City Council. Today, I'm gonna to be moderating the hearing and calling on panelists to testify. We are actually going to begin with a public panel. Before we begin, please remember that everyone is going to be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a delay of a few seconds before you are unmuted and we can hear you. Again, for public testimony, I will call up individuals and panelists. Please listen for your name and I will periodically call the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And for today's hearing, the first panel will include public testimony from youth of the New York City Youth Action Board in the following order. Elizabeth Sutter, Key King, Lyndon Hernandez, Alexander Perez, and Naisha Humphrey. And we are going to begin with Elizabeth Sutter. Your time will begin. Good morning to the panelists and the committee. My name is Elizabeth Sutter. I am 23 years old, and I'm urging council to pass intro 2405. I myself was in DYCD shelters roughly for three and a half years, almost four years, and that experience was very much traumatizing. Um, I was once in DYCD shelters, then to HUD, and anyway. And just this will just make it easier to me to get this for youth because based off my own experience, my own peers' experience, um, it is traumatizing. It is belittling in a sense. And even after my experience staying in these shelters, I ended up back on the streets, back in the drop-ins, back with staying with family, friends, families, you know, and I'm just being recently placed out of all that time into my own home. And to me, being, youth having access within DHL shelters to this voucher, that's great, great opportunity, but youth who are in DYCD shelters just deserve as much as a chance. Um, the systems are very similar, and just because youth are in the DHLs does not make their experience any more mature, any more of an importance. So I please, please urge council to pass this bill of intro 
2045. So all of my youth, all of my peers do not have to worry about where they're sleeping, where they could possibly go, if their experience are invalid and they can have permanent stability in housing. Thank you so, so much, Elizabeth. We're gonna move now to Key King. Your time will begin. Hello, I'm Key King. I'm Key, you uh, muted yourself by acting. I'm Key King, pronoun she, her, they, them. I am a youth with live experience in DYCD shelters. And I believe that homeless youth should have the same vouchers as any other homeless person in DHS shelters because it is the same experience. And when in a homeless youth shelter, there's kind of only one path that they can lead you down. And it makes it very challenging because not every youth wants to go down that path. I left the DYCD shelters numerous times to rent different rooms throughout the city. And the city FEPS voucher can also help youth throughout the city rent different rooms instead of having to stay in the shelter program. The time counted at the DYCD shelter should also count as time as any DHS shelter because it is the same circumstances, just a different age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Key, for your testimony. We're going to move now to Lyndon Hernandez. Your time will begin. Good morning, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lyndon. Good morning, Council. My name is Linda Hernandez, I'm 24 years old. I represent the New York City Youth Action Board. I wanna thank you all for holding this hearing and allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'll be limiting my testimony only to intro 2045, which would finally give youth in the Department of Youth and Community Development Shelters access to city FEPS vouchers which has been provided since 2016. I've resided in both DYCD and DHS shelters while being homeless and also a parenting youth. I understood that in order to be provided access to permanent housing and vouchers such as City FEPS and SOTA, you needed to reside in a DHS facility. Prior to meeting the mother of my child, that was an individual who first came into contact with the DHS shelter on 30th Street in Manhattan. I was then transferred to Covenant House and shortly after was placed in a transitional independent living facility to DYCD. When I first came back into contact with the DHS system was after I met my spouse who had also been living at Covenant House during the time where we both decided to get a domestic partnership in order to be provided services through PATH as a couple where shortly after we were expecting my son to be born. After months of working with case management, we finally got a permanent housing option in New Jersey, allowing vouchers to be provided to youth in DYCD facilities would have allowed me to have more sustainable housing options in a shorter amount of time. Instead of, have, instead of having to self-discharge from where I was residing to be provided with better housing options that are only offered through DHS facilities. The unfairness call to youth in our city is the reason we still face a homelessness crisis due to the lack of housing options offered to youth residing in New York City. To allow, to allow youth the opportunity to take time residing in DHS and DYCD and allow those youth the same access to vouchers others have access to would give the opportunity for more youth to exit homelessness and provide a better community for all of our youth today. I really appreciate your time. Mr. Hernandez, I'd like to just ask, uh, where are you now? Where are you living right now? 
currently I'm living with a relative who is at the moment threatening to evict my living situation. And are you in, in New Jersey or in New York? Currently I'm in New York City. I was residing in New Jersey, but my lease expired in June. Okay. How's the baby? My son is currently residing with his mother in New Jersey. Okay. He's doing okay though? Yes. There you go. Um, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hernandez, for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank you, counsel. Thank you again, Lyndon, for your testimony. We're going to move now to Alexander Perez. Grand Rising, everyone. My name is Alexander Rey Perez. I use he, king, and divine pronouns. I'm 28 years old, and I appreciate you all for allowing this hearing and welcoming me to speak. I'll be limiting my testimony to intro 2405, which would finally give the Department of Youth and Community Development Shelters access to city FEPS vouchers which has been promised since 2016. I testified in 2017 to raise the age for youth receiving access to youth shelters. I was 24 and I was terrified of the idea of having uh, to access the adult sh shelter system. However, I was told over and again that this was the only way and that I was told horrible stories by fellow youth about these adult shelters and the harm that could happen specifically towards being queer, trans and youth in these spaces. I testify because I know how harmful having to access multiple systems for young people uh, can be. And it not only increases harm um, and time on the streets, it is just plain dangerous. Allowing youth to have access to these vouchers can uh, only just feels fair and reduces harm. I urge the city council to pass intro 2405 so that youth experiencing homelessness can finally have a fair chance at getting stable and a permanent place to live. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Alexander. I want to acknowledge that Councilmember Diaz has her hand raised. Councilmember Diaz, we're gonna take the last panelist for this panel, and then we will turn to you for questions or um, your statement. I'm gonna to move to Naisha Humphrey for testimony. Your time. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I hope you all had a great weekend and this testimony finds you well. My name is Naja Humphrey. I am 22 years old, and today I will be testifying on behalf of Intro 2405, which will finally give youth in Department of Youth and Community Development Shelters access to City FEPS vouchers, which has been promised since 2016. Blessed is the child that has their own. I am a homeless survivor. I have experienced what it's like to be a homeless youth in New York City firsthand. I understand what it's like to be susceptible to drugs and crime due to the dearth of stability. Not knowing where you will go after you age out of the DYCD shelter at 21 discourages youth to return to a lifestyle that they were running away from. There are great benefits for the city and the community if intro 2405 is approved and it will encourage youth to be more responsible and productive because they have something to look forward to. If there are more productive members of society, there will be less crime and healthier mentally, um, and people will be healthier mentally because people would have time to sit still and take a broad analyzation of their own mental and physical health. Having, how, having access to vouchers will help youth to have their own, and they will be able to be grateful and appreciative of what they have instead of looking at um, their situation now as something that's just un unfortunate. They can look up and see the light. Thank you all for your consideration, for hearing me out, and for your compassion. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Naisha, and thanks so much to this entire panel. I am now going to turn it back over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much um, to this entire panel. Um, is there, um, uh, 
remarkable that you all um, uh, are doing such amazing uh, jobs in terms of um, your lives. Um, despite having these major obstacles that have been put in front of you um, and trying to navigate um, this city, which can be tough for anybody to navigate. Um, but uh, you have done a remarkable job and I want to thank you for, um, for your very moving testimony, your very impactful testimony. Um, um, I think it's really important that um, we at the council here and um, uh, the administration um, hear about your lived experience and understand um, that you know that a commitment was made in 2016 to make city FEPs available to youth who are aging out of the RHY system as well as youth who are aging out of the foster care system. And that the city up to now has not honored that commitment in any meaningful way. And that now is the time um, that we have to do something about it. We have to uh, have legislation to ensure that, that that these programs are available to young people who are reaching out of the RHY and foster care system. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Diaz. I think she has either a statement or question. Thank you, Chair Levin. I, I, I want to thank the youth that spoke here today. Having been oh, an employee at a shelter system, I, I, I fought for many of your battles as you came into my shelter. So I, I know your stories personally, definitely saddened to hear that the system was just mistreated you. Cause at the end of the day, that's what happened. But your stories to me indicate you fall through the cracks and that's not what the system was created for. I, I like to ask Mr. Hernandez a question, if he would allow me in reference to the voucher that was used to, so that you could be um, housed in, in Jersey. I use the soda voucher. Okay. Do you mind sharing? You, you were there for a year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Will you push out well, of not shelter? Well, not, not even mm -hmm. for a year because uh, when I resided in my apartment, three months later, my house had caught on fire. It was caught on fire. Did you reach, were you, were you told you could, be, you could reach back out to DHS for any, for aftercare? I wasn't provided no assistance afterwards, no. Okay. And if I stood incorrectly, if I understand correctly, your family is now split? Yes. Folks here today, you know, this, this is real talk. If, if we have adults that are struggling through the system, can you imagine what it is to be a 20 year old young man who was lived through the shelter system, meet someone, has a child, moves to another state to further hindrance their growth? We have to do better. DHS, you just have to do better. Thank you, my colleagues, for allowing the youth to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez, for sharing your story. Thank you, Council. I'm done. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. I also want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Councilmember Beth Lander. I am now going to call our second panel. For today, our second panel will include representatives from the Administration for Children's Services and the Department of Social Services, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. I am now going to call on Stephanie Gendel, Deputy Commissioner of External Affairs at the Administration for Children's Services, and Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Social Services to testify. Deputy Commissioners Gendel and Drinkwater are also joined by several members of the administration who will be available for questions and answers. I'm now going to administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Gendel. I do. Thank you. 
Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater. I do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Julie Farber. I do. Deputy Commissioner Alan Sputz. I do. Thank you. Chief Medical Officer Angel Mendoza. I do. Thank you. Senior Assistant Commissioner for Detention, Lewis Watts. I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott. I do. Thank you. And finally, RHY Director Tracy Thorne. I do. Thank you all. Deputy Commissioner Gandell, you may begin when the Sergeant at Arms cues you. Good morning, Chair Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee. I am Stephanie Gandell, the Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Administration for Children's Services. With me today from ACS is Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner for Family Permanency Services, Dr. Angel Mendoza, Chief Medical Officer, um, Alan Spess, Deputy Commissioner for Family Court Legal Services, and Lewis Watts, Senior Assistant Commissioner for Detention Services. I want to first thank the youth for their testimony today. Your voices are essential for all of us to hear, so thank you for being here. We also appreciate the opportunity to testify about the four bills related to ACS that are being discussed today. We at ACS appreciate the City Council and the advocates' continued interest in the safety and well being of the children and youth in the city's care through both the child welfare and juvenile justice systems, as well as in the services and supports we provide to families. Given the role ACS plays in the lives of children and families, an essential part of our work is providing access and information to the city council, the public advocate, oversight agencies, including the State Office of Children and Family Services, advocates, legal service providers, and most importantly, children and families. As a cornerstone of this transparency prior to the pandemic, ACS regularly hosted elected officials, advocates, and others at our various programs and sites. We look forward to enhancing this work as the pandemic, pandemic continues to subside, keeping in mind the security, confidentiality, and needs of the children and youth. ACS also posts extensive data and other information on our website and meets regularly with key stakeholders to share additional information. I turn now to the bills being discussed today. Intro 1304-2018 would authorize council members and the public advocate to quote, inspect and visit at any time any secure or non-secure detention facility administered in whole or in part by ACS, end quote. ACS operates two secure detention facilities, Horizon in the Bronx and Crossroads in Brooklyn. ACS also contracts with nonprofit service providers to operate seven non-secure detention facilities. As of October 18th, 2021, there were 60 youth at Horizon, 79 youth at Crossroads, and 25 youth in non-secure detention. Prior to the pandemic, ACS hosted many scheduled tours of Horizon and Crossroads for elected officials. And we also included elected officials in our Summer Freedom School Harambe event, where elected officials read stories and had the opportunity to dance with our youth in detention. We always did this in a manner that was safe for the youth, our staff and our guests, and in a manner that was intentional about protecting the confidentiality of the youth in our care. It is important to us that elected officials and others are able to see our detention facilities, meet our staff, see the programming offered, see and meet the medical and mental health teams, and see DOE's Passages Academy. We have worked very hard to make our detention facilities as positive and supportive as possible, and to give youth the services and supports they need. And we certainly want council members and the public advocate to see and experience this. Given our interest in ensuring the safety and security of the youth in detention, ACS has limited the number of people coming to the facility throughout the pandemic, which has included reducing the number of tours. This was done to protect the youth and staff from the spread of COVID-19 as much as possible. As the community spread decreases and more and more New Yorkers have been vaccinated, ACS has opened the facilities back up to both in-person family visits and in-person programming. We would be happy to schedule opportunities for elected officials to visit our sites in the coming months. State law does not allow elected officials to make unannounced visits to secure or non-secure detention facilities. Horizon, 
Horizon, Crossroads, and the non-secure detention facilities are licensed and regulated by the state. State regulations for secure and non-secure detention are quite specific as to which people are permitted to make inspections or visits to juvenile detention facilities and elected officials are not included in the regulations. Intro 1992-2020 would require ACS to create a pilot program to train at least 5% of the frontline child protection specialists or CPS in how to provide reasonable accommodations that people with developmental, intellectual, and physical disabilities may require, such as providing more time for case conferences and casework contacts, special assistance with travel to appointments, time management guidance, and referring to classes available for parents with developmental, intellectual, or physical disabilities. 18 months after the start of the pilot, ACS would need to submit a report to the council and the mayor um, about recommendations on how the program could be con continued or expanded. ACS appreciates the council, particularly council member Ayala, who sponsored the bill, for the interest in ensuring that parents with developmental, intellectual, or physical disabilities who are working with our CPS are receiving the services and supports most appropriate for their needs. We agree that this is essential for both the parents and children who come into contact with the child welfare system. ACS currently implements a model similar to what is envisioned in the legislation. ACS provides all of our child protection specialists with access to expert consultation in intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities. This includes medical consultants, as well as an ACS team that is specifically dedicated to providing expert guidance to direct care staff working with families with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We refer to this unit as the DDU. Every DCP borough office has on-site consultants providing CPS staff with expertise when needed. The clinical consultants include a domestic violence consultant, a credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor or CASAC, and a medical consultant. The medical consultants are nurse practitioners contracted through health and hospitals, and part of their role is to provide expertise and training regarding individuals with physical disabilities. Medical consultants also participate in case conferences and help CPS understand and implement the ways to minimize safety risks when parents have disabilities. The ACS DDU within the Office of Child and Family Health is a technical assistance unit that can refer CPS to experts in intellectual and developmental disabilities and are available for consultation with CPS at any time. In addition to providing consultation in individual cases, the DDU staff are available to participate in family team conferences, serve as a liaison between the parent and the DD service provider, and maintain connections with DD service providers throughout the city. The ACS DDU also coordinates parenting class skills classes that are specifically tailored for parents with known or suspected intellectual and or developmental disabilities. Unlike the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, or OPWDD, services funded by the state, parents do not have to meet threshold eligibility requirements for these ACS-funded services. Parents in this program are also linked to other supports, including health homes, whenever possible. The DDU can also assist parents in getting assessed by our contractor for OPWDD-provided parenting skills classes and then with enrolling if they are eligible. The DDU also engages staff, providers, and communities in numerous ways aimed at providing education about the best ways to support those with intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities through webinars, lunch and learn sessions, and resource fairs throughout the boroughs. Finally, the ACS Workforce Institute offers a training open to all ACS staff entitled Engaging Parents with Cognitive and Other Developmental Limitations in which over 800 ACS and provider staff have participated over the past year. Intro 2419-2021 would require ACS to create quarterly reports regarding the number of days children are placed at the Nicholas A. Scapetta Children's Center, the Youth Reception Centers, or YRCs, and the Rapid Intervention Centers, or RICs. ACS operates the Nicholas A. Scapetta Children's Center in contrast with four providers to operate YRCs. ACS's pre-placement continuum includes the Children's Center with a capacity of 100 and four YRCs with a total capacity of 45 children. 
When children must be removed from a parent due to imminent risk to the child's health and safety, ACS makes every effort to immediately identify a foster home setting to meet the child's needs with priority for kinship placements. We have established pre-placement settings to make sure we can immediately meet the needs of a child following removal or re-entry to care in a safe and nurturing environment while we expeditiously work to find an appropriate longer term placement. Our goal is always to make sure stays at the Children's Center or YRCs are as short as possible. The YRCs include the Sheltering Arms Reception Center, which has 15 beds to serve boys and girls ages zero to 12, Mercy First Virginia Residence, which is a 12 bed co-ed facility for youth ages 14 and up, the Good Shepherd Services Shirley Chisholm Center, which is a 10 bed facility serving girls age 14 and up, and HeartShare St. Vincent's Fox Hills, which is an eight bed co-ed facility for youth ages 14 and up. YRCs are settings where youth can be engaged in a trauma-focused, strength-based clinical assessment and case planning process that will result in the implementation of a safe, supportive, timely out-of-home placement or family reunification plan. ACS also contracts for three rapid intervention centers or RICs, which are not pre-placement facilities, but provide respite and residential care for youth in foster care who need crisis stabilization and or assessments. RICs provide a short-term stabilizing and safe environment where individualized assessments and strength-based treatment plans tailored to youth and family needs are developed. The Children's Center is a 24-7 temporary foster care placement facility where we provide care and support for some of New York City's most vulnerable children and youth who enter foster care due to abuse or neglect or other family disruption. The Children's Center serves approximately 1,230 unique children and youth each year from newborns up to age 21. 80% of the children are at the Children's Center for seven days or less, and 60% of the children are there for less than three days. Just 5% of the children are at the Children's Center for 30 days or more. Additional monthly data regarding the Children's Center is available on our website in our monthly flash report. There you will see that for year-to-date calendar year 2021, the average daily population at the Children's Center was 62 children. The Children's Center is staffed with child care specialists, social workers, programming and wellness staff, and engagement and visiting specialists. There's also an on-site full-time pediatrician and nursing staff, the ACS Bellevue Mental Health Team, and JCCA provides additional clinical services to youth with high needs. ACS also contracts with Safe Horizon to provide consultants specializing in engaging youth who are, who are at risk or have been victims of sex trafficking. In addition, we have on-site Cure Violence Credible Messenger Mentors, Youth Advocate Program Family Finders and Advocates, the KSAC, and ACS Peace Officers who help maintain safety. ACS has taken a number of steps to improve the experience of children and youth at the Children's Center, including the creation of four additional programming spaces for children to use for community meetings and developmentally appropriate programs and workshops and recreation, and a multi-faith room which offers children a private, quiet area to practice their faith. Programming offers youth healthy, pro-social, and emotional outlets, provides enrichment and recreation, and helps reduce the impact of trauma. This year, ACS doubled the number of programming staff at the Children's Center. Children's Center programming ranges from therapeutic art classes taught from our community partners, such as the National Arts Club, Culture for One, and a place to be to programs that focus on life skills, music, performing arts, fitness, healthy relationships, and safer sex, youth voice and empowerment, health education, and much more. Staff also chaperone youth to offsite activities such as New York City cultural institutions, sporting events, college and employment fairs, aquariums, and with the fall weather, for example, apple picking two weekends ago and Fright Fest at Great Adventure this past weekend. The team also organizes events for children to learn about and celebrate cultural events. For instance, in October, the Children's Sense held events to recognize LGBTQ history, Hispanic heritage, and the Mid-Autumn Festival. Over the past two summers, programming also introduced the Children's Defense Fund Freedom School model. This year, the Children's Center also partnered with DOHMH and Zero to Three 
to develop and deliver compassionate response training for all direct care staff. Additionally, a new partnership with Bridge Kids New York added a new training for direct care staff regarding caring for children with special needs. Intro 2420-2021 would require ACS to conduct quarterly random audits of a statistically significant sample of foster care placement change notices to document how often ACS failed to produce the notice, how long it took to send the notice to the attorney for the child from when the placement change occurred, and whether it include, included all legally required information, and if not, what was missing. This bill requires quarterly reports of the quarterly audits. ACS appreciates the importance of timely notification to attorneys for children regarding where children are placed and whether there is or may be a change in the child's placement. ACS has a process in place for this purpose. While placement change notification requirements passed into law in 2020, ACS has been providing placement change notifications since 2010. In 2010, ACS adopted a policy requiring CPS and foster care agency case planners to notify the attorney for the child of any plan placement changes 10 days in advance of any plan change or as soon as a decision is made to change the placement or no later than the next day after an emergency move. In 2012, a new process was implemented to improve this process by establishing a mailbox for CPS and case planners to email our Family Court Legal Services or FCLS division with anticipated and actual placement changes. The FCLS notification unit is responsible for taking the emails from the mailbox looking up the contact information for the attorneys and sending out a notice to the appropriate attorney for the child. Legal Aid and Lawyers for Children also set up a central mailbox to receive the notices and distribute to their staff. In 2020, the Family Court Act and Social Services Law were amended to create a statutory requirement regarding placement change notifications. Under the 2020 law, which went into effect at the height of the pandemic, notices are now also sent to the attorneys for the parents and to the court. Notifications from the central mailbox are not the only means by which attorneys and the court are notified of anticipated and actual placement changes. CPS, case planners, and FCLS attorneys also provide information on placement, location, and moves to attorneys for children, parents' attorneys, and the court at court hearings, in court reports, and in other communication between parties throughout the pendency of the case. Notices are sent to the ACS mailbox from the Children's Center, the ACS Office of Placement Services, the foster care providers, and the Division of Child Protection when there's an initial placement, an anticipated placement change, and an actual placement change. Notification of initial placements was added to the statutory requirements in September 2021 as part of the Family First legislation. Prior to this, to this statutory change, ACS notified attorneys for children, parents and the court of children of initial placement leave for children leaving the children's center. Notices include the docket number, child's first name, and first letter of the last name, in keeping with ACS information security protocols, date of placement, agency with whom the child is placed, the type of placement, meaning kinship home, foster boarding home, or other placement type, contact name and number for the agency case planner, and the FCLS attorney. On September 29th, 2021, the Family First provisions became effective in New York. Building upon the existent, existing placement change notification process, ACS is now also required to provide notice of initial placements, as well as notice and then a motion to the parties in the court whenever we believe that a child may be placed in a Qualified Residential Treatment Program, or QRTP. ACS is using the training opportunity that comes with Family First to reinforce to DCPA, the Office of Placement, the Children's Center staff and our foster care providers that they must send the notification to the placement change notification mailbox so that the attorneys and the court can be notified promptly. In conclusion, I want to once again thank the council, the advocates, and the legal providers for their interest in ensuring that the children, youth, and families served by ACS receive the highest quality care. As a government agency charged with promoting the safety and well being of the city's children, we agree that transportation and accountability are essential. We look forward to discussing these bills further with the council and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Gendel. 
We are now going to turn to Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater for testimony from the Department of Social Services. Good morning. I want to thank the General Welfare Committee and Chair Levin for holding today's hearing and the opportunity to testify. My name is Erin Drinkwater, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Social Services. The committee is reviewing several bills today impacting DSS, and we look forward to learning the sponsor's intent and discussing them further. As we discuss these proposals today, we request the committee consider the impact that they would have on our existing programs and services, particularly around capacity, client safety, and improvements made to date. With this in mind, we look forward to today's discussion. Introduction 2379 would require the Department of Social Services to create a domestic violence shelter specifically designated for men. We look forward to working with the sponsor to better understand the bill's intent. DSS is the administering agency for New York State's Office of Children and Family Services domestic violence shelters in New York City. Under state law, we are required to provide domestic violence shelters and services to all who qualify regardless of gender identity. In calendar year 2021 to date, the Human Resources Administration Domestic Violence Shelter System has served 77 households headed by individuals who identify as male. As drafted, the bill presents challenges that could have a negative impact on the capacity of our shelter system and the safety of those we serve. First, regarding capacity, we are obligated to provide domestic violence shelter and services to all who qualify and creating a men only domestic violence shelter would limit access to survivors who would, apart from their gender identity, be eligible to enter the shelter, consequently reducing our ability to help those in need given the limitations presented by this proposal. Regarding client safety, establishing this type of shelter could exclude men who are not safe in the proposed shelters area due to borough preclusions needed to be considered in placement determinations. Multiple men-only shelters would have to be created to address the safety concern. Which, would an additional, which, excuse me, which in addition to fiscal concerns associated with expansion could be compounded by the low demand for men only domestic violence shelter based on system wide use by men. Lastly, the bill requires a report analyzing the impact and effectiveness of such shelter. Given the federal requirements in relation to client confidentiality, there would be additional steps required for client data collection. We look forward to working with the sponsor and advocates to ensure the domestic violence system continues to serve clients irrespective of gender identity in culturally competent and trauma-informed approaches. Introduction 1829 would preclude the Department of Homeless Services from requiring a child's present at intake when a family with children applies for shelter, regardless of individual case circumstances. To provide some background, before the pandemic, as a result of the mayor's 90-day review of homeless services, DHS reformed the requirement for children to be present during intake at PATH to streamline the application process for families with children. The intent of this reform, which applied to families reapplying for temporary housing within 30 days, was to preserve as much educational stability as possible for children 0 to 17 years old by removing the requirement to return to PATH with the adult head of household for follow-up appointments. We took this reform further during the pandemic to ease the shelter intake process for families with children. Since the pandemic, families with children applying for shelter must make an initial visit to PATH to apply, but children are not required to accompany the parent. Parents can use FaceTime or Skype to provide PATH staff an opportunity to observe the children with follow-up assessments being allowed in a similar fashion. While we have implemented these systemic reforms and do, while we have implemented these systemic reforms and do not intend to reverse them, there are particular individual case circumstances that arise when having a child physically present at intake is needed in the placement process. For example, to confirm that the applicant actually has the children in their care and custody when there is a concern that they do not. DHS has made significant reforms as path to ensure safety and a welcoming environment for all families that seek shelter. We've taken particular focus in serving children who come to PATH and have on-site play areas, as well as a mobile activity center intended to minimize the potential trauma when applying for shelter. We look forward to working with the sponsor on these matters. Intro 2405 is in relation to the eligibility for rental assistance for one or a homeless youth. 
We appreciate the council support of the 12 month pilot program the city launched in the summer to connect youth to city perhaps rental assistance vouchers. Given that the pilot just launched, the city needs time to assess the impact of those vouchers in connecting youth to housing and to consider any adjustments needed. We look forward to updating the council on the progress of the pilot as we consider this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony today. We look forward to reviewing these bills and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you to the members of the administration for your testimony today. I am now going to turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much um, to members of the administration for your testimony. Um, I apologize everybody, I was, uh, there was a, uh, an accident on, um, on the subway this morning and so I was, I was uh, finding other ways of getting back down to the office. So, um, I do appreciate everyone's uh, testimony so far. Um, <clears> the <throat> first question is uh, on um, the RHY uh, City FEPS bill. Uh, so there was two, two pilot programs. Um, I mean, I guess we could take a step back and say that initially when the City FEPS um, program rules were promulgated, um, this would have been in 2018, I believe, 2017, 2018. Um, there was provisions that um, in that, uh, in the rules that allowed for the commissioner of ACS and the commissioner of DYCD to, um, to refer cases to DSS um, to consider for uh, a city FEPS voucher. How many, how many times did that happen with both ACS and DYCD? I think I'm unmuted, but I, Aaron, are you going to take this question, or do you want? This is prior. I'm talking about prior to the to the pilot. Um, you know, in the in the intervening time between Sorry. the the promulgated rule and the pilot, how many how many instances of referrals from from agency commissioners that's allowed in the rule? Thanks, sorry, I was having uh, uh, trouble with the mute button. Um, I don't have those numbers uh, with me today. So the, the number prior, so after the streamlining, the implementation of the rule and prior to the pilot, I don't have that. Yeah. Um, we can certainly follow up. I don't know if Stephanie, you do have that number. Do you guys, did you have that? I can answer for ACS. Um, we hadn't been following a specific process of referrals until we started the pilot. Um, and I'm happy to give an update on the city perhaps pilot for ACS, if that's helpful. I realize that's not what the bill is yeah. about, but I'm happy to update on the pilot. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, um, um, I mean, I'm really, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. I, I, um, I, uh, I meant uh, Kilowatt needs to chime in for a second. I just, I just want to chime in as a reminder to members of the administration, if you can remain unmuted during this entire segment, it'll just be easier on the back end to ensure that you can chime in as necessary. So if you can please remain unmuted, all panelists from the administration during this question and answer period. And also a reminder to council members who may have questions to use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you after the chair has finished his line of questions. Thanks, thanks Chair Levin. Thank you, council. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm trying to get a clear picture. I mean, I, just to put all the cards on the table. I mean, we had introduced this bill, or we had, we had talked about introducing this bill a long time ago, and we had introduced the ACS bill, um, the companion ACS bill a long time ago. And so it was always my intention to make it clear in law that some that youth that are aging out of foster care and youth that are aging out of DYCD, um, RHY shelters, don't have to go into 
the DHS or DSS system in order to qualify for a voucher. Like simple, straightforward, no kid that ages out of a system should be having to go into another system designed for adults to get access to a voucher. Simple, straightforward. I, I didn't do the bill because it was being addressed in the rule. The rule said that we would allow referrals from the commissioners. And presumably that would then take place. So, I mean, there's an intervening period between that rule and when these pilot programs came out that um, where that rule was in place. The reason I did not do a bill was because that rule was in place. And so it would be really, it's really important for me in considering this legislation to know how effective that rule was. Um, and, uh, and so um, that's why that's important. Um, no, I guess I could, I wanna ask about the pilots then. Um, can you, can, can, um, can Director Thorne maybe speak to the RHY pilot um, and, um, and how that's been going? How many referrals have been made? How many youth have been connected to a city FEPS voucher to date? Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for the question and, how, and also um, bringing attention to this crucial resource. Um, so far, we are, we've um, given 12 young people cities that have shopping letters, and we have a lease package in the works as we speak today. That's great. Um, how many, under the terms of the pilot, how many, um, what's the scope, what's the scale, scope of the pilot? What's the scale? The scale, we have 50 um, cities that have shopping um, letters that are available to us. And we are really emphasizing the flexibility of city for HEPs um, in terms of room rentals and um, which really supports the, the needs of young adults and youth. Um, and I also just wanted to say that the increased rent also in, improves the um, likelihood that young people will be able to find apartments in New York City. So, um, yeah. Yeah, now, um, I, I guess this is a question for, for both ACS and DYCD. If, if youth had act, I mean, is, do you see any reason why youth shouldn't have access as at, 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 at what, from aging out to these vouchers? I'll just Again. say as a starting place, I think it's important to just make sure it's clear that no youth from ACS is discharged to homelessness. That was the case during the pandemic, prior to the pandemic and continues to be the case. And we're always ensuring that our youth have um, a permanent place to go when they leave foster care where we let them stay in foster care after their 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. The pilot is, is very new. So we were due to start in July and we did start in July. And then we gave out five um, City for Hep shopping letters in July. Um, but then when the council, which we greatly appreciate and thank you for your leadership on of increasing the value of the voucher, we wanted to ensure that our young people had access to the higher um, rate of the voucher. And mm -hmm. so we gave out the remaining vouchers in throughout September. And so we currently have um, 50, all 50 of the shopping letters with young people um, pursuing housing through City FAHEPS, um, as well as continuing to pursue housing through um, other opportunities. Okay. And I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that, um, and I, I appreciate that, that no youth is, um, is aging out into homelessness. Do, does ACS track over the course of like five years after aging out, whether young people end up in the DHS system? 
We definitely track what's in local law 145, which I think goes up to two years after um, they we have foster care as opposed to five. And it's a very small number. I don't know it off the top of my head and I don't know if Julie does, um, but it's a very small number. Or if there is, um, I mean, I, I would, housing insecure or unstably housed, not just in the, in the, I mean, I know, I know that, that, that you, you know, young people are doubling up, are couch surfing, um, doubling up is fine if they have like a, a, a room, but uh, couch surfing or, um, you know, staying with family that might not be uh, appropriate or, or safe. Uh, right. Or others, uh, other type of unsafe, uh, unsafe living circumstances. Right? I can see Julie wants to chime in, but I'll just first say sure. that we work very hard and are very planful about all of these discharges for our young people. And then I'll let, I can see Julie wants to chime in. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member, um, for these questions. Um, and as um, Stephanie referenced, um, we do not exit young people to homelessness. Um, we are always working to ensure that they have um, stable housing. Um, we're very pleased that we have all 50 of the FAHEPS letters with young people and they're working on um, finding apartments with our support and support from the foster care agencies. Um, we also, um, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, um, we do collect data on young people that show up in the shelter system. Um, I know we do it after one year and maybe also after two years, and that number is very, very small and also um, has been going down um, over the last um, five or six years. Um, we also um, you know, have staff here that support young people even um, when they have um, left the system. And we also coordinate with DHS when we see young people um, you know, in the relatively rare occurrence when they show up in the shelter system. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna, uh, I, the, there's a little bit of a disconnect for me on this, um, on this discussion, which is, why, what reason is there possibly out there to not make vouchers available to youth aging out of either the DYCD, RHY system or the foster care system? What, what reason could there possibly be to, to say That's this a is a bad idea? idea? I just, I can't even think of a reason why it's a bad idea, even a theoretical reason. Um, I mean, so I think that, you know, DYCD and ACS talked about the work that they're doing with the pilot. Um, and part of that pilot is to also, uh, you know, look at that and conduct an analysis um, following that pilot to understand the impact of those vouchers. And I think using that information I mean, will be very helpful moving forward. Well, I don't have time for that because I I'm out of office in two months, so I only have I only have I mean, you know, it's not like we just started talking about this. We started talking about this, you know, years ago, um, three four years ago. Um, so, you know, I don't I just don't have the time. You know, I hope you understand that. I just don't have the time to, 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 to kind of further analyze this. Again, I can't even think of a theoretical reason, you know, why somebody aging out shouldn't have immediate access to the voucher. I, don't, I can't even think of a theoretical reason. I mean, I understand we have to, you know, it's good to analyze it, but like, again, we, we started talking about this, like, years ago, the rule allowed for it to be, I mean, I mean, I'll just be totally honest. I mean, like the city told me that when the rule, the rule would take care of it. Like that was the response I got at the time. Just don't do the bill because we have a rule. The rule will address the issue. And, you know, and then, and then there was like a gap between the rule and the pilot program of like a couple of years. And, and we don't even know how many referrals came in 
from the commissioners of DYCD and ACS. I don't know why we don't know. But I just like, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I, I like, I'm debating whether to channel my inner Lou Fiddler right now. Um, uh, because, you know, I could just imagine if Lou was here right now, how absolutely insanely upset he would be. Um, uh, you know, he's the former chair of the youth services and a big champion of RHY. And to think that there's an option available that's just not available. It's, it's out there, but it's not available. Unless, unless you go into a DHS shelter meant for adults as a single adult, which may be in congregate in the middle of a pandemic. It's, it's so, I mean, I, I just, you know, if there's any bills of mine that I think are just open and shut cases, um, these are the bills. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to any of my colleagues for questions if they have any. Councilor Diaz, do you have questions? Oh, you're on mute. I apologize. I'm working from home. One of the few times I do that, my iPad is not my friend today. It's just, I, I want rooms. To me, rooms are not the most ideal place for an individual to live. You're sharing space. And if our youth could have lived in rooms with their families, they wouldn't be in the situation they are today. I, rooms are not the way to go. And I, I hear rooms, 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 chair 11. It just leads to more conflict and, and more discourse. We have to figure out, if, if I hear the conversation of an SRO, which at least you're not sharing space, you share kitchen space, that's one conversation. But to know, oh, we're so happy and excited to know that we're exiting, which I see more of pushing our young people to live in a shared space, they probably got them in this place to begin with. So while I appreciate the conversation of trying to make something happen, rooms is not a voucher that we should be pushing. We should figure out a way, stable homes that they do not return back into the system. Whether it's the shelter system, it's DYCD. One of our youth began our conversation. Our, our, he, he hopped. He was exited as a youth into a, a room. Became a parent as a couple, went into an apartment. Ended up in Jersey and is back basically on the streets. Rooms are not an answer. Chair, I apologize if I come across an, um, angry and antsy, but having worked the system for 13 and a half years, I come from, from a different face, you know, a, a different picture. Rooms is, is, is not the way to go. Um, and let, let's be clear, you know, if, if the youth want to, if anyone that wants to get out of shelter, they'll accept the room. But we have to assure that the leases are real. They would do real inspections. So we're moving into a room to then leave the room because there was a discourse or the services that were supposed to have been provided weren't provided. That's an issue. I have someone that would move into a room and once she was dead, so she couldn't have a TV. That's basics. Forget during COVID because you just imagine you're living in a room, you're sharing a refrigerator, you're sharing your bathroom, all your amenities, and you can't have something basic as, as a TV. We need to do better. And I'm gonna say on and on throughout this hearing, we need to do better. With New York, millions and trillions of dollars are spent on housing. Housing is a human right. Let's not just push people so that our numbers look better. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member. Um, Council, do you see any other uh, committee members with their hands up? I do not, Chair. Uh, we were also joined uh, by Councilmember Brad Lander. Um, I'm not sure if Brad is still here, but we, he has been here. Um, so I'll ask some questions around uh, some of the other legislation. Um, for intro um, 2419 for ACS reporting requirements on the Children's Center. Um, Have there been any recent increases in the number of children at the Children's Center or has the numbers remained 
um, steady. I know a couple of years ago they were they were high. How does that compare to where it was in 2019? It's significantly lower than 2019, um, but it is a little higher than the average. So um, the average for 2021 was 62. We currently, as of Saturday, had 78 children at the children's home. Saturday, October 16th. Um, and do you have a, a sense of the, the ratio of um, staff, children to staff? Yeah, the, the ratio is one to three. And that's been maintained despite um, you know, increases or, or decreases in the, in the population? Yeah, we have the ability to bring in additional staff if needed, be it people who work for ACS and other capacities who've been trained to also work there for attempts if ever we needed it based on the, um, the census so that we can maintain the ratio. Um, do you keep detailed data on length of stay um, of, you know, in terms of, obviously in the, you, you do, you do keep the data, but I mean, do you aggregate it in a way that um, you can analyze and um, understand, um, understand what's, what's causing increases and decreases? Yeah, we have a, you know, we're always keeping track of how many children are at the children's center and their length of stay. And, you know, most importantly, we're always working to do everything we can so that children are placed in the most appropriate placement out of the children's center, whether that's returning home to their family, going to a foster home, or in some instances, a residential provider. We're always looking to ensure they, you know, get out of the children's center and into the most appropriate placement. Um. And is that something that that you make public in any way right now in terms of average length of stays or any any other kind of metrics from the children's center? Are you are you publicly sure. reporting on any of that? So we we currently publicly report in the monthly flash that's available on our website that we update each month, um, where we keep track. Where we we provide um, calendar year to date uh, monthly averages of children at the children's center. Um, and um, some of the information that you're asking about length of stay. Um, mm -hmm. I also, as in my testimony, talked about um, some of the length of stay numbers, including um, that 80% of the young people and children are there um, for seven days or less. Um, I mean, one thing that we're very concerned about are the outliers. So um, young people that are, so do we have a sense of how many uh, young people right now have been there, for example, longer than 20 days, longer than 30 days, longer than 45, 60, so, 90. Right. So I happen to not have 20 days at my fingertips, um, but I have other okay. options. Um, okay. So I know um, that there are only 5% that are there for more than 30 days. Okay. As opposed to, so I don't have the 20 day. Um, yeah, but you have 30 day. I have, um, if you, there's 12% that are there for 15 days or more. Um, and of those, do we know who they are? are they Are they predominantly adolescents? Um, or are they children with special needs? I don't have that data specifically. Um, but I do have a little information about the last couple of months. Um, so it's not for the whole calendar year, um, but for um, July through September of 2021, there were 101 children who exited after 20 days and 55% of those were 11 or older. So 45% were under 11. Sorry, can you, so 55% were over 11. So there's, so, do you see a disparity in terms of, or what are you able to glean from, from that data in terms of, of um, the relationship between length of stay and, um, and, uh, and, and either special needs status or, or uh, age? I mean, I think one of the things that's just important to keep in mind as we think about the children coming in and out of the children's center is it changes from one day to the next. Um, since most of the children are there for such a short time, um, 
there's constantly different children that we would be talking about each each day. Um, luckily, not a lot of new children, but removals are way down too. But um, you know, it's not the same from one day to the next. Um, I don't know um, if Julie has anything she would want to add about um, the trend data that you're asking for. Yeah. So. Um... As um, Stephanie mentioned, um, uh, the numbers I have in front of me, so 60%, right, leave within uh, three days, 80% within seven days, 90% uh, less, than, less, less than 15 days. Um, so the vast majority, obviously, of children um, are leaving to placement relatively quickly. The other thing um, that I know you're familiar with, um, Chair, is that our first focus is on placing children with kin. So, um, so we're keeping many, many children out of the children's center um, through those efforts. And so at this point um, of the children who are coming into care um, due to abuse and neglect, about 50% of those children are being placed with kin. Um, so that, that is a huge focus for us. Um, and then obviously we are, always working um, to move children who can't be immediately placed with kin. We continue to look for kin. Um, and then, you know, when kin really cannot be found, um, we work to place them in the, you know, the foster home that best meets their needs. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I, I do want to focus kind of on, on the children that are kind of in outlier cases. Are there, are there instances where there are children that are there for longer than 60 days or, or longer than that? 90. There are sometimes. Um, and, you know, we're working always very hard to find them the most appropriate. Are there any children there now that have been there for longer than 60 days? Longer than 60 days? Yeah. I would guess so from the data I'm looking at, but I don't have that for sure, so we need to get back. Um, I mean, what are what are circumstances that would cause a child to, to be there for longer than 60 days, considering that 90% are there for no longer than 14 days? So, um, you know, when we're placing a child, we're considering a lot of different factors. We're considering geography, we're considering the child's needs. Um, we're considering clinical issues. Um, there are some, and you know, these are outliers, um, you know, as you've said, council member, but sometimes um, when young people have a placement um, but don't want to go to their placement. And so we're, you know, working, um, you know, with young people, um, you know, in those situations. And of course, you know, want to value, um, you know, young people's perspective, particularly teenagers. Um, and so, there are, you know, certain instances, um, you know, such as that, that can contribute to longer lengths of stay, but we are always, you know, working to find the right match, the right fit, you know, the right foster parents. Um, if a child needs, you know, clinical and therapeutic treatment, you know, in a residential program, we're working to, you know, place a child in the, in the right place. And in the meantime, when they're at the Children's Center, as Deputy Commissioner um, Gendel noted, um, there is a significant amount of programming and clinical and therapeutic services in place at the Children's Center. Right, I think that, you know, it's, but it's in, it's not an, you know, an appropriate setting for a, you know, it's never meant to be um, a even, medium term placement it's, it's there to be temporary so any i mean i i think that obviously it's 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 good to hear that uh, the vast majority of, of children are are there for a short period of time i but i i do worry about even if it's only um you know a small number of children um they're they're there for longer periods of time just because it's you know you, the lack of uh, access to uh, to you know uh, socialization with other children, um, uh, you know longer term relationships, um, familial relationships, um, 
you know, just a, a home, you know, a home is, is really important for a kid. And, um, so, we agree with you that we want children to be in home-based settings as much as possible. I do want to make sure um, the kids do have ample opportunity and they are socializing, they're going to school. Um, and so I just want to make sure they're socializing uh, with other children, both in the children's center and going to school. Right. But even if they're socializing with children in the children's center and 90% of them are, are, are there for less than 14 days, it's you know, difficult to have any meaningful ongoing relationship with another kid if they're there for days. Um, in any event, I'll, um, I'll move on. Uh, there's sorry, one other question about, um, we heard that the, we've heard that the, the babies and toddlers wing is in quarantine. Um, hmm. How does that work in terms of quarantine? Sure. Um, thank you for asking that question. We take the health and safety of the children at the Children's Center and throughout our system very seriously. They're in quarantine due to an exposure um, to COVID. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mendoza to talk more about that. Yes. So we once, of course, uh, we follow all DOH and, and, and state DOH guidelines and CDC guidelines in terms of quarantine and isolation. I'm glad to say that we are just a day away from um, uh, uh, releasing uh, the, the child who was positive from isolation and just, uh, um, I believe, four days away from releasing the rest of the quarantine. Um, we also, while they're in quarantine, they stay with their quarantine group. So they are um, interacting with those who are in the same group. Um, so we try to keep them in that uh, in infection control, quote unquote, bubble. And um, they are also engaged in different activities within the bubble. Um, they have visits, uh, virtual visits um, with their families as well. And um, as much as possible, we also maintain other kinds of activities that we can, while they are still safe within that uh, quarantine bubble. Um, we are so proud to say that um, we have had very, very, very low um, cases of COVID-19 positivity rates at the Children's Center. Um, in fact, even when the city was at uh, high transmission rates, the Children's Center was averaging in the low transmission rate. And we continue to average in the low transmission rate. Um, and I, we really feel that this is because of our strict adherence to infection control uh, practices. Dr. Mendoza. Um, uh, sorry. Um, I'm going to uh, move over to another piece of legislation, um, uh, 2420, which would require um, an audit report on foster care placement notices. Um, we've heard, uh, and I'm wondering if this is true, um, that ACS has a shortage of therapeutic foster homes to meet the needs uh, that are currently existing in the foster care system. Thank you. I wasn't sure. I didn't think that's what you were going to ask about that piece of legislation, right. um, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to answer. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, so um, our foster care providers um, are working very hard, um, as I mentioned, to increase the proportion of young people who are placed with kin, right? So that happens both by the Division of Child Protection and then also by our foster care agencies. And then at the same time, obviously, the agencies are also um, focused intensively on foster parent recruitment and support. Um, and so prior to the pandemic, um, we drastically increased um, new foster home recruitment um, across all different types of foster care, including therapeutic foster care that you asked about, council member. Um, the pandemic did have a little bit of an impact on um, foster home recruitment, but I am very pleased that in this past year, um, we are now rising out of that impact um, and moving back to foster home recruitment uh, levels uh, prior to the pandemic. Can you speak to maybe some of the challenges that you face in recruiting foster parents for older uh, youth or youth with, um, 
with disabilities? Yeah, so we, um, the strategies that we use and that have really been most effective in recruiting foster parents for older youth and for children with special needs is focusing on recruiting from existing experienced foster parents. So we have foster parents who come in and they are in uh, what's considered sort of regular foster care. And then there's therapeutic foster care um, and specialized foster care. And while some foster parents can be recruited directly from the community to those higher needs groups, um, we have found that the most successful approach for recruiting foster parents for therapeutic and specialized is really to focus on existing foster parents who have had some experience um, and uh, to support those foster parents to transition to taking older youth and children with special needs. And then the, the critical piece of the work there is really around the support. It's not just around the recruitment, but it's around the support that is provided to foster parents. And so there's a lot of work happening around both the support that um, the foster care agencies are providing, but also the support that the community of foster parents are providing to one another. Um, and so that's really where we have found it is most effective and where we're focusing our energies in terms of recruiting and supporting foster parents for older youth and young people with special needs. Um, have you considered or uh, what impact raising the um, the boarding rates for foster parents? So um, that, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chair. Oh, sorry. Um, is that entirely within your jurisdiction, or is that an OCFS? Um, is that something you work on with OCFS? in terms of the boarding rates? We have um, some control over it. Obviously, um, state funding is a piece of it, but as I think you know, Chair, the city far outspends the foster care block grant um, you know, that, the, that the state provides. Um, so that's obviously a, you know, um, an important piece of the financing. But in terms of... Um, the, the payment rates that um, are provided to foster parents are certainly um, a piece of the puzzle um, in addition to um, emotional support, moral support, training, uh, and so forth. Um, are you ever, do you ever face a situation where a child is placed in a group setting simply for a lack of a foster home? So or as, group yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, go, go ahead, ahead, chair. Or, or as I say, or are group setting placements entirely um, due to um, the appropriateness of the setting? Is there ever a situation where the, a foster home is preferable, it's just not available? So we are, you know, we have a, an entire function at ACS that um, determines what's called the appropriate level of care. Um, and whether a child um, needs a regular foster home, a therapeutic foster home, a specialized foster home, or do they need um, you know, services and stabilization in a residential program? And so those determinations are, are made by that function. And um, obviously that relates directly to the new um, Family First law that has gone into place. And so we now have what's called the QI, qualified individuals um, who make those decisions and they are firewalled from the folks who actually make the placements. Um, and so the focus is always on finding the most appropriate placement according to what the level of care uh, is that has been identified. And I don't know if uh, I can see that Stephanie wants to say something more about Family First. Sure, I can do that. I think, um, you know, to answer your question, we were always seeking to find the most appropriate placement for children, but we now under Family First have additional 
layers before a child um, would, would be in what's now called a qualified residential treatment program, which is essentially our residential care providers. Um, that qualified individual that Julie mentions required to use an evidence-based tool that we've just implemented called the CASI. Um, and they also are, they're required to speak with what's called the permanency team, which includes the child, their family, um, the child's lawyer and other people involved in the child's life. Um, and they put that all together to make the recommendation about whether or not residential care or QRTP is the appropriate level of care. Um, that will now have an additional court review. Um, so um, I think adding on the new family first requirements, um, had this ever been occurring before, should really um, prevent it from happening again. And if we do have a young person in congregate care who um, the QI says that's not the right level of care, we would no longer receive federal funding for that young person. So that, that as a, that would be enough of a deterrent or enough of a, um, an obstacle Essentially, if, 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 it's not, if, it's, if it's not determined, you're saying under this evidence-based framework as being an appropriate placement, <laughs> then there would be no federal reimbursement for? That's correct. I don't know that necessarily the lack of federal funding would be the deterrent. We really were very focused on finding the most appropriate placement. And I think these enhanced processes of review, both the assessment by the qualified individual and then the court review, um, are really what would um, provide the additional layers of ensuring youth um, who are in residential care are youth who have a therapeutic need to be there. And definitely okay. the, the staff who are making the level of care determinations and making the placements, they, they have no focus whatsoever on federal funding um, reimbursement. Their focus is entirely on the, the, the needs of the child. Right. Um, so, so then, I mean, I guess my question then would be, are, are, you, are you saying that it never happens or it, under the current uh, Family First uh, law, it, there's no circumstance where that would happen? I think that there should is- Should never. Right, well, it, it certainly should never happen. Um, I think there is also the fact that, um, you know, there can be, uh, different viewpoints on, um, you know, the best possible setting for a young person, which is also yeah. the benefit of having the QI. There's also the young person's view, the parent's view, the court's view. Um, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, it, it is not always, um, you know, sort of one way or the other. The other piece is that, um, you know, circumstances can change, children's needs can change and evolve. Um, so, but, you know, obviously our focus is on placing children in the setting that will best meet their needs. We have, you know, very low rate in New York City of placement in residential care. It's about eight or 9% um, of all kids in foster care. So it is, it is not something that, that happens very often. Um, and it is something that we are extremely focused on uh, continuing to reduce. And um, of course, you know, council member that we are currently in the process of re RFPing, re-procuring the entire foster care system and a, you know, major focus of the RFP and the new contracts is on increasing kin, increasing family-based placement, only use, utilizing residential care for time-limited treatment um, and for the purpose of stabilization and, you know, returning ideally uh, to parents and families um, and or returning the community to foster parents. Um. I, I, um, I apologize, I, I, I didn't quite uh, get this before, but do you, is the administration or is ACS uh, in, in favor of this piece of legislation 2420 or are there issues that you have with it as a bill? We are happy to um, discuss the bills further. Okay. Neither one way or another, is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are, um, as you mentioned in the testimony, some considerations we'd want to discuss, and we're happy to discuss mm -hmm. them. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, commissioners, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to just ask about 1829 um, very quickly. That's the um, the path bill. Um, is there uh, is there any reason why DSS would ever revert to requiring children to be attending path in person? In other words, for this bill, like, what's the downside to this bill? This is, it's a practice that is, we shouldn't be having. Yeah, so we don't have an intention of reverting back, um, but the, as written, um, the bill uh, categorically, um, you know, it would be on the parents if the parents would bring their children in, but there are times, um, as mentioned in testimony, um, if we're trying to work with the family to understand um, that a child is in the custody uh, of the head of household, um, having that child present uh, can be of a benefit. Um, would you be amenable to working with the sponsor um, to- Absolutely. Um, to see if there's a, accommodations that can be written into the bill? Um, but that would largely codify the current practice into, uh, into law. Yeah, we'd be happy to meet with the sponsor. I know, Chair, that you and, and Council Member Diaz went to PATH not too long ago, um, certainly saw um, some of the efforts made, particularly around you know, children who are at PATH, um, and would be happy to offer the same to Council Member Ayala and then certainly work with her uh, on the bill. Um, just for the record, Council Member Diaz and I um, went to path. It was um, not. It was sparsely attended. It was. I mean, it was. A, it was. There was not a lot of. There were not a lot of families there. Um, this was on a you know a weekday morning. So, um, you know, that's. There's probably a number of reasons why that's the case, but um, um, obviously we. That's a good thing. We don't want to see more families. Um, okay, I appreciate the, I'll, I'll convey this to Councilman Brayala, um, Wonderful. and we'll see if we get somewhere in this bill. Great. Um, okay, that's, that's it for me. Um, um, I know that there's other pieces of legislation that Councilman Brayala sponsored, um, um, and I think that she can speak with, with the administration offline about that. Um, as well, but uh, I also want to acknowledge Councilmember Solomon Mata has joined, um, and and put it to my colleagues once more. If anyone has any questions before we move on to public testimony, okay. All right, seeing none, I want to thank uh, members of the administration for your testimony this morning. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I think this is probably my last hearing, uh, not, not the last hearing in, in, uh, in general, but the last hearing uh, where we're considering legislation. So from here on out, there's gonna be hard hitting oversight hearings uh, between now and the end of the year. Sounds great, Chair. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. And uh, it's good to see you all. And um, you know, maybe one day we'll be able to do that in person, but I don't know if that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for, the, for now, we're just going to have to be content with the Zoom hearing. Um, okay, uh, thank you all. I'll turn it back over to Committee Council Kilowand uh, to call up the first public panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin. We have now concluded the administration's testimony and are going to turn to additional public testimony. I want to, again, remind everyone that I'm going to call up individuals in panels once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. And please remember that there is a few seconds delay when you are un unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And our next panel, which will be comprised of public testimony in the order of speaking will be Jamie Polovich, Anna Blundell, and Julia Davis. And we are going to begin with Jamie. 
Your time will begin. Good morning. My name is Jamie Polovich, and I am the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Thank you to Chair Levin for holding today's hearing. I'll be limiting my testimony to intro 2405, which CHY is in full support of. Despite many broken promises, youth in the DYCD system still do not have equal access to city FEPS vouchers. I would like to outline the history that has led to the need for this bill. In April 2016, the first promise of voucher access for homeless youth was made when the mayor released his Review of Homeless Service Agencies and Programs report. This promise was echoed in February 2017 in the Turning the Tide on Homelessness in New York City report, which stated, quote, in 2017, the city will expand these rental assistance programs to include for the first time youth living in DYCDU shelters at risk of entering DHS shelters, end quote. Fast forward to April 2017 at the General Welfare Oversight Hearing regarding reforms to homeless services one year later, when Commissioner Banks testified regarding DYCD youth getting access to vouchers that it, quote, is expected to be finalized in the summer of 2017, end quote. During questioning, Chair Levin asked Commissioner Banks, quote, when do you expect that the first youth young person will have a voucher in hand, end quote, to which Commissioner Banks responded under oath, quote, in the fall, end quote. In fiscal year 17, 1,804 youth exited the DYCD shelter system into homelessness. In September 2017, at the Youth Services Oversight Hearing, DYCD Commissioner Chong testified under oath that, quote, we are working with HRA to help eliminate young eligible youth apply for and access link housing subsidies, end quote. This was untrue, as DYCD youth never had access to link vouchers. In June 2018, the mayor announced the creation of the New York City Youth Homelessness Task Force. In fiscal year 18, another 1,466 youth exited into homelessness. In January 2019, the task force released its report that has still not been acknowledged by the administration that commissioned it, which included the recommendation to, quote, determine and implement the eligibility and community referral process for homeless youth residing in DYCD programs to access city FEPS, end quote. In March 2019, when CHY asked DYCD what the status of getting access to city FEPS for runaway and homeless youth was, they responded via an email that, quote, we have had some very productive meetings with HRA and are close to finalizing, end quote. However, in April 2021, CHY obtained a copy of an NMOU that DYCD signed with HRA on October 4th, 2019, that would force DYCD residents to go into DHS shelters prior to being found eligible for city FEPS vouchers. In fiscal year 19, another 1,235 years exited into homelessness. You could continue, Jamie. Thank you. In July 2019, the mayor again announced that the city was, quote, working with the DYCD to connect certain eligible young people transitioning out of DYCD shelter and entering DHS shelter with city FEPS rental assistance, end quote. In fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21, another 2,430 youth exited into homelessness. Since initially promising youth in DYCD shelters access to vouchers in 2016, 6,935 youth have remained homeless, that we know of. That is almost 7,000 missed opportunities the city had to change the outcome for youth experiencing homelessness. We urge you to pass intro 2405. Thank you. Jamie, can I just ask you, um, so not all of those young people aged out into the DHS system, but but uh, very few, if any, are aging out into a stable housing situation, right? So the, the numbers that I quoted are from FOIL data as well as the local law 86 reports when they were started being produced. Um, and they incorporate young people that were discharged from shelter into shelter um, or shelter in, onto the streets. So remain um, home. So you laid out in a much in much clearer fashion um, uh, than I did what uh, you know what we were we were trying to get at. Um, why do you think this has been um, the case for so long? 
Well, I think to put it frankly, it's because people don't like to share, right? I think it has to do with money and that we consider folks homeless based on the systems that they're a part of and the money that's being spent in those systems instead of actually considering homelessness as an experience um, and a trauma and then making resources avail available to everyone that meets that definition. Um, so I, I, I can't remember Diaz has questions for, for DHS, so I'm gonna turn it over to her, but uh, I'm gonna ask you uh, a, for a favor uh, mm -hmm. for us here is if you can continue to, over the coming months, um, coming weeks, I mean, really, uh, uh, make um, as much noise about this issue in this bill as you can. Um, um, we'd greatly appreciate it because I think that we need to make this. We need we need everybody in the city to understand that this is happening. Um, uh, we, we collectively channel our inner Lou Fiddlers and um, and uh, you know kind of like do this in his in his honor. Um, that'd be a good thing. Um, you can imagine. Um, uh, maybe I'll actually reach out to his family too. Let's see if we, if we could recruit them. But it's, um, uh, you know, it's it's an it's an outrage that there's this option available. It's now at a market rate, um, so they're actually usable vouchers now. Um, uh, and you know, and we can have it. It, 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 it is um, it's the right thing to do. So if if we could work together and and, and really um, make some noise on this one. Um, it would be great. Definitely, we, we're happy to make noise and I just wanna thank you again for all of your leadership with this issue. And since as far back as I can remember, you've never missed an opportunity at a hearing or another forum to advocate for young people to get vouchers. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie, thanks. Okay, I'll turn it over to Councilor Diaz. And then I have to actually step off for a few minutes because I'm joining another hearing, but, um, but I'm here and uh, I'll, be, I'll be back. But I'm going to turn it over to Councilor Diaz. Your time will begin. Thank you. My my questioning is for Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater. Are you still on? Yes, Hi. I'm here. Wait, we're good. Thank you again for taking your time to be with us today. In your in your statement, you mentioned there were 70, 77 men under the um, domestic violence. That's correct. The domestic violence. There's uh, 77 uh, households that include a head of household that is male or a single adult that is male. Okay. The report I have as of March 21st, we had 171 in the same category. I'm interested in knowing how do the numbers decrease so quickly. Which report are you referencing? I was given a DHS report. I have to go back to my notes. I'll, I'll send you the report itself, but I was given so I'm working from home and multitasking. No problem. It was, I, I, yeah, I just I don't, I don't want to comment on a report. If it's a DHS report, yes, I'm, ref yes, yes. I'm referring to the HRA domestic violence shelter system. And okay. there were 77 uh, in calendar year 21 year to date, 77 uh, male headed households or uh, single adult men. Okay, so I'm going to send you what was sent to me a couple of months ago, because it, if I'm correct, it's the same reporting mechanism that DHS uses. That's where the data was was taken from. Right. So now, yeah, I'm happy to look at it just to okay. make clear this. It's the, this is I'm referring to the HRA domestic violence shelter system, not DHS. Okay. DHS Thank doesn't you. administer the DB system. I understand. Thank you. Now you mentioned that there would be perhaps a federal compliance issue. Correct. So there is a uh, very strict uh, requirements under uh, federal guidelines as it relates to information that can be shared um, from survivors who are receiving services. Um, and so in terms of the reporting requirement that's included in the bill, um, it's one additional layer that we would need to take into consideration um, as we're exploring uh, the bill. Great. I did some research over the weekend, and it seems that Texas and Dallas, they were able to figure out a way to work with men. It seems to be the first state that has addressed the issue for domestic violence and men in particular. So I like to work on that so we can figure out how to do that. And then you mentioned the reference to safe zones. 
I see it no different than we would replace a family or an individual when it comes to safe zones. And if it means we have to have more than one shelter, we have five boroughs. I'm, I'm, opening, I'm open to having more than one shelter specifically to work with individual identifiers as men. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, council member. You're welcome. Thank you, council member Diaz. We are now going to turn back over to our public testimony. We're going to call on Anna Blundell and Anna will be followed by Julia Davis. Over to Anna. Your time will begin. Thank you, Chair Levin and City Council. My name is Anna Blondell. I am a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society Juvenile Rights Practice. Our office represents children at the center of child welfare matters in family court, and many are children placed in foster care and held in temporary placement facilities. Legal Aid has submitted joint testimony with the Coalition for the Homeless on the shelter-related bills before the council and ceded our testimony time to the young people with lived experience who have testified so powerfully in support of the City FEPS bill before you today. But I want to speak to you regarding two bills, intro 2419 and 2420, and to demonstrate why they would create transparency and improve the experience of children in foster care. On intro 2420, as ACS just testified, ACS is already obligated by law, regulations, ACS policy to notify a child's attorney before the child is moved through the foster care system. But attorneys for children almost always receive notice after ACS has already removed the child. For instance, ACS giving notice at a court hearing or in a court report is too late. The child has already been moved. I'll give you just one example of how this hurts children in care. We represent a five-year-old boy who has been thriving in a foster home for a year. This fall, his foster mother needed to enroll him in school so that she could go back to work. She wanted to continue to care for this boy, but no one at the agency was helping to enroll him in school. And so with her back against the wall, she put in her notice asking for him to be removed. Our staff was not notified by ACS, but luckily we found out through the attorney for the parent and we moved rapidly to intervene. We helped enroll the child in school quickly, preserved the placement, and this five-year-old boy did not need to be moved through the system. And that is it. It sounds incredibly simple, but it was deeply significant for this five-year-old child. Advance notice, as already required, allows us to do our jobs, assist our clients, and avoid needless disruptions. Um, without timely notice, countless children have been denied needed advocacy. This happens daily, and children are unnecessarily traumatized. Uh, data on the length of placement at the Children's Center and other temporary placement facilities, intro 2419, is equally critical as there are too many kids held for too long without adequate care. ACS testified before City Council this June that at least 153 children have been held at the Children's Center for over 20 days. And while the Children's Center census did plummet at the beginning of the pandemic, they're back to pre-pandemic levels. In August, there was an average of 83 children at the Children's Center per day. Um, there were 78 children at the Children's Center this Saturday. We have clients right now, some as young as four years old, who have been in the Children's Center for months, certainly over 60 days, and who have had multiple quarantines after exposure to COVID. There is no excuse for this excessive reliance on temporary placement facilities. The proposed bill would mandate comprehensive reporting, providing the city council Time and has other... expired. I have just a few more. You could go ahead and finish. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Uh, the proposed bill would mandate comprehensive reporting, providing the city council and other stakeholders with the data necessary to ensure that children aren't languishing at temporary placement facilities instead of homes where they belong. We ask you to review our written testimony and are happy to address any questions. Thank you very much, Anna, for your testimony. We will now turn to Julia Davis. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and members who um, are joining us today. Thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you for revisiting all this much needed legislation. I'm Julia Davis. I'm the Director of Youth Justice and Child Welfare at the Children's Defense Fund New York. We advocate for young people across the state and in the city, and uh, detention is, is a special issue for us in part because uh, our freedom schools operate in juvenile detention in New York City. We support uh, 20, 
419, which is the bill that our colleagues from Legal Aid just discussed with regard to information about children who are staying at the Children's Center. And we stand with the Coalition for Homeless Youth and Legal Aid on uh, 2405. I want to focus for a moment on the bill that we haven't spent a lot of time on today, which is 1304, which allows city council members and the public advocate to visit youth detention centers in the city. And I, I focus on this today just so that we remember what's going on in detention. During the spring we saw an enormous, spring of 2020, we saw an enormous decrease in the number of kids in detention. That is not the case today. We've seen a 25% increase in the number of kids in secure detention in the city. And that is in part due to the slowdowns in the courts. I raise this with you because it is so important for you all to be in the facilities. It's an important component of oversight, but this is an important constituency as well. Young people are spending much longer in detention. What was a year ago, an average of about two months is now closer to three months. This really changes the dynamic of what young people need, not only those that, who are detained, but also their families. So as city council moves forward with this bill and others, I urge you to use this as an opportunity to visit with young people, their siblings, their parents, their families, and center these young people in particular in the responses that the city creates for COVID recovery. Young people in detention need to be the center of all of your work. This bill is one opportunity to make that connection, to be in these spaces with young people and to know more about what they need to thrive and to move forward. So I wanna thank you all today and remind you that detention is not only an issue for young people, it's an issue of freedom. And uh, it is also a critical issue related to racial disparity. 94% of young people in detention in the city today are Black and Latinx. This is a crucial group of young people that need to hear you and see you and need to have you in the buildings. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much to this entire panel for your testimony. I am now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order. John Sentigar, Nadia Swanson, and Deborah Berkman. And we are going to begin with John Sentigar. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Sentigar, and I am a member of the advocacy team at Covenant House New York, where we serve youth experiencing homelessness ages 16 to 24 years old. I'd like to thank the Committee on General Welfare and Chairperson Steve Levin, Levin for the opportunity to submit testimony today. Um, I am limiting my testimony to intro 2405. Uh, you heard earlier from Jamie Polovich about the city's repeated promises to reform homeless services to accommodate youth getting access to vouchers, but this has still not happened. Time and time again, our dedicated and experienced aftercare housing managers struggle to find housing options for young people who are about to leave our transitional housing programs, even when the client has met all of their individual and program goals. This creates a bottleneck in our programs as a young person in our shelter won't be able to move into a till until there's a bed available. But we won't release that bed until we can be sure that the young person exiting our till has an appropriate place to stay. This needs to change and this is why Covenant House New York is in full support of intro 2405. While the pilot program initiated this summer that provides 50 city FEPS housing vouchers to youth is a good start, it's nowhere near enough. Covenant House New York will ideally be provided 10 of those vouchers for youth in our programs, but as of today, or this week when I checked, we've already had 43 youth sign up for this assistance. So this means we'll have to turn many of them away and determine another plan for them. In fiscal year 2020, only 29 of the 2,791 young people discharged from a DYCD shelter moved into unsubsidized housing. Many had no other option but to become homeless. The city needs to provide more funding to help administer these programs. And while we are grateful that these 50 vouchers have been made available, it amounts to also to a lot of additional staff time without additional funding. Ultimately, youth experiencing homelessness in New York City need much more than 50 vouchers from the city. Meaningful change needs to take place. Time spent in a youth shelter must be counted towards time spent as homeless by the DSS. Youth homelessness is an epidemic and it is at crisis levels in New York City and across the country. Young people desperately need access to affordable and sustainable housing, and the numbers clearly reflect this. 
Counting their time spent in a youth shelter towards eligibility for city SPEPs will be an essential tool in making that happen. It does not make sense that because a young person is accessing services through a different city agency, one that specializes in developmentally appropriate services, they should be denied a major pathway to achieving housing stability. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We know the city has difficult decisions to make, but young people experiencing homelessness are already marginalized and the current economic realities make it even harder for them to break free from poverty. Passing intro 2405 will go a long way towards ensuring homeless youth in New York City are better able to obtain independent and permanent housing. This change to benefit young New Yorkers facing homelessness will ensure positive outcomes and promote positive systemic change in the face of a continuing homeless crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for your testimony. I'm gonna turn now to Nadia Swanson, who will be followed by Deborah Brookman. Over to Nadia. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Nadia Swanson, and I'm the National Technical Assistance and Advocacy Consultant at the Ali Fournier Center. Thank you to the committee and Chair Levin for this hearing and for this committee's ongoing support of youth experiencing homelessness in New York City. The Ali Fournier Center and myself are in full support of Intro 2405, a bill which will provide runaway and homeless youth in DYCD shelters access to FEPS. Um, as a member of Coalition for Homeless Youth, we support their testimony as well, and specifically want to thank uh, the youth who spoke earlier. The Alien Fournay Center is the nation's largest and most comprehensive service for LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness. We believe that housing is a human right, and that youth should never need to experience homelessness, let alone have increased barriers to accessing permanent housing. We know that youth, especially LGBTQ plus young people, experience immense amounts of trauma when needing to access DHS shelters. And that the longer you stay in the shelter system, it greatly increases the risk of decompensation, which makes them less likely to be able to thrive independently. We need to be giving youth permanent housing as quickly as possible after accessing homeless services. Young people's experiences in DHS are so damaging that AFC youth do not even consider going to DHS in order to get a voucher creating a several year long delay to accessing permanent housing. At AFC, we serve over 2000 youth a year. And in the last 10 years of our agency, we only know of a few young people that were successful in obtaining a voucher through DHS. In 2017, Mayor de Blasio promised youth access to vouchers and we are still waiting. There's no reason why time in a DYCD shelter should not count as time spent in a shelter for a voucher, but it does for supportive housing. Not all youth qualify for supportive housing and deserve support to stability. As a city, we need to be doing everything in our power to reduce the amount of trauma and violence that face LGBTQ youth and denying them access to city FEPS vouchers for their time spent on the street or in DYCD shelter is a direct link to the violence they ultimately face. By passing this intro 2405, you'll be giving all youth the ability to thrive independently, prevent and heal from trauma and reach their individual goals beyond survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. We will turn now to Deborah Berkman for testimony. Thank you. Your time will begin. Chair Levin, council members and staff, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Committee on General Welfare. My name is Deborah Berkman, and I'm the coordinating attorney of the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at the New York Legal Assistance Group, or at NILAG. Uh, the Shelter Advocacy Initiative provides legal services and advocacy to low-income people in and trying to access the shelter system. Based on my experience working with families and young people experiencing homelessness, I appreciate this opportunity to testify about the dramatically positive impact intros number 1829 and 2405 would have on my clients' lives. I'll start with intro 1829. Since uh, the COVID crisis began, DHS has been temporarily allowing families with children to apply for shelter at PATH without the children being present, but as you know, has indicated that this may not be a permanent change. Prior to COVID-19, families with children applying for shelter would spend 10 to 20 hours in PATH every time they applied. Having a policy that mandates children spend 10 to 20 hours in an office necessarily precludes them from regularly attending school. And it's been well established that students experiencing homelessness test well behind their housed peers, forcing these children to be present at PATH instead of being at school only by this disparity. And we're not talking about one missed day at school. Many of my clients are deemed ineligible for shelter based on administrative issues with their applications, and they have to apply again and again. 
And prior to COVID, reapplying would entail restarting the process from the beginning, having the entire family, including the children, go back to PATH and spend another 10 to 20 hours completing a new application for shelter, typically identical to the prior application, and then waiting on site for a new temporary shelter placement. So some of my clients' children would miss a day of school every 10 days, and that would force them to fall further and further behind house children. Um, this is unacceptable hardship for children who are experiencing homelessness, and missing school is only part of the problem with having children be present at PATH. Many of my clients reported that while waiting at PATH, families were provided very little, if any, food, and that there are no outlets to charge their phones or other devices so their children could be kept busy while they waited. They were also warned not to leave lest they would lose their places in line, and none of these factors create an appropriate environment for children. Um, additionally, applicants for family shelter have to provide extremely detailed accounts of why they can't currently stay at any of the places that they've lived for the last two years. And also, um, sensitive topics such as domestic violence or domestic abuse. Most of my clients don't want their children to have to hear about these disturbing and painful personal experiences, and they shouldn't have to. And I just want to take a moment to address uh, what Deputy uh, Commissioner Drinkwater said about having to make sure that there are being instances where past staff has to make sure that the parent is in the custody. If the policy has been in place for 18 months and that hasn't been the case, why would that be the case in the future? Moreover, if the child is not actually in the custody of the applying parent, it will become immediate ob immediately obvious once a family shelter placement is made because that child won't show up at the placement. So it just doesn't make sense what uh, that reason. I also want to support um, intro number 2405. It's an extremely necessary step that NILAG like, strongly supports preventing young people from- I'm sorry, can I just- You go ahead and finish, yeah, of course. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, preventing these young people from obtaining uh, vouchers just increases the amount of time that they have to experience in homelessness and it lengthens their shelter stays. And a policy that prevents young people from achieving, ho achieving housing stability while allowing older adults to do so can only be con considered arbitrary and it disadvantages those who need those protections most. And it also uh, requiring young people to, uh, to transfer into single adult shelter, which has a higher risk of violence just to have the chance of permanent housing adds additional trauma to their already difficult lives. So NILAG like, wholeheartedly endorses uh, intro 2405. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, and thank you for, to this entire panel for your testimony. I'm now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order, Jimmy Mager and Josefa Silva. And we are going to begin with Jim. Oh, I see that uh, Councilmember Diaz has her hand raised. Over to Councilmember Diaz. Thank you again for the opportunity. My question is to Ms. Nadia Swanson. Hi, it's in reference to the 2010 E application. You mentioned that not all um, within your population qualify. Can you give me an example as to why, what category they're not meeting? Yeah, so normally it would be um, having to have a serious persistent mental health diagnosis, um, right. HIV, other serious chronic medical condition. And so usually we can do PTSD or something like that, but it's not always accepted. Um, so someone who doesn't have a serious persistent mental health diagnosis might not qualify for the supportive housing. It's My understanding is that it, if we could prove that they were displaced within the last five years, no high school diploma, um, mental illness, displacement, God, is it falls on, on, under mental illness. I, I'm just really curious as to why your applications are being denied after me knowing so many applications that, that go through. Yeah, um, I, it's a great question. I, yeah, the, I'm not sure because they yeah, should, yeah. Like, but it's not happening. Yeah. We have to look at the psychosocials. Yeah. That, that, are, that are being submitted. Mm -hmm. We can feel free to give me a call um, after this today. Maybe I, I'd like to have more conversation with you. With, with your process, because your population to me means a category generally. So yeah, I want to uh, clarify many do, right? Like mm -hmm. we get a lot of people qualified for supportive housing, but there's some uh -huh. that just fall through that crack, right? Who might not have strong enough history. Maybe they haven't been with us for, 
you know, too long or for, the, for a year. Okay. They've okay. hit a year, but if they want a stronger diagnosis, there's just like other factors that they keep, they'll shoot back. Um, but we do get a lot of people placed in supportive housing. As well. Okay. Thank you. Totally. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. And again, thank you, um, Nadia, for responding to Councilmember Diaz's questions. I'm now going to call up Jimmy Meager. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jimmy Marr. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm policy director at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered, trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who have experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using a lens of racial equity to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in, de in developing the public positions we hold. Safe Horizon has programs across New York City's five boroughs where, where we provide critical support and services to victims and survivors of all forms of violence and abuse. Across all of our programs, whether they serve survivors of domestic violence, family violence, trafficking, et cetera, one of the top needs for our clients has always been and continues to be housing. I'm here today to enthusiastically endorse two critical pieces of legislation, intro 2405, which will provide RHY in the DYCD shelter system access to City of Hep's rental assistance program, and intro 1829, uh, which would preclude DHS from requiring that every member of a family be present at its intake center when that family seeks placement at a shelter. Both bills write unjust policies that have harmed the young people we serve and show care and understanding to the most vulnerable members of our communities. So first, intro 2405. Our street work project works with homeless and street involved young people up to the age 25 to help them find safety and stability. Many homeless young people face a day to day struggle to survive, which can lead to physical and emotional harm. Homeless youth may have experienced family abuse, violence, rejection and instability that led to their homelessness. We welcome these young folks, help them navigate complex systems and provide essential resources at our drop in centers at our overnight shelter and through our street outreach, outreach teams. This work can be incredibly challenging, but also rewarding. Street work did not pause during this pandemic. Rather, our dedicated team continued to respond to homeless and at-risk young people in need of shelter, services, and understanding. Street work has been doing this community-based work for decades. And we know that young people experiencing homelessness need and deserve housing and economic justice. That is why we support Intro 2405. We support policies that will make permanent, safe, and affordable housing accessible to young people experiencing homelessness and unstable housing. For years, we and our community of service providers have encouraged the city to count time in youth shelters as homeless time for the purpose of eligibility for housing resources and vouchers. Um, we've been advocating that our clients have equal access to the same housing resources as other homeless New Yorkers. Um, this bill is critical, necessary, and a right step towards connecting RHY to stable housing. And for intro 1829, our programs offer information, referrals, and advocacy for shelter and permanent housing. Um, our clients tell us all the time how difficult and challenging the intake process for shelter is. Entering shelter can be extremely disruptive, and we join advocates and unhoused New Yorkers in demanding that we make this process as trauma-informed, simple, safe, I'm and uninspired. I just have one, uh, two more sentences. You can go ahead and finish the first. Thank you. Um, uh, we demand that we make this process as trauma-informed, simple, safe, and undisruptive as possible. Ordinarily, DHS requires that children under the age of 21 be present with, the, uh, with their adult family members at the facility that processes shelter applications. This bill would allow these families to complete the application process without disrupting children's schooling or other daily activities. Um, the city currently exempts children from PATH due to the pandemic. This bill is an opportunity to make permanent this temporary change so that families have flexibility and children no longer have to experience the stress and trauma of going to paths uh, to path. Pass this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very Thank much, you, Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh, and I apologize for getting your last name wrong. I think it's the second time that I've done that. So I apologize. I am now going to turn it over to Josefa Silva. Time starts now. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to speak in support of intro 1829, which would preclude DHS from requiring parents to bring their minor children to the intake center, known as PATH, when they apply. Um, as we've heard, this bill will make permanent DHS's current exemption of children from the center. Uh, my name is Josefa Silva, and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at WIND, New York City's largest provider of shelter and supportive housing for families with children. 
I'm testifying today because of the heart-wrenching accounts that we hear from families at Wynn about their experience in the intake center. We'd like to thank Councilmember Ayala for listening to families who've experienced homelessness and for responding with action and intention to alleviate some of the hardship they face. I'm gonna begin by saying something that we already know, but that is important context for how families experience PATH. In order to access shelter, families have to apply to DHS and they have to prove that they have nowhere else to stay. For fa families with minor children, that very intrusive and very high stakes process of applying begins by going to PATH, located in the Bronx. Families have described going through PATH as grueling and harsh at best, and most often they described it as being punitive and re-traumatizing. Before COVID-19, DHS required parents to bring their children when they applied for the first time. As we understand it and heard today, this requirement was in place to allow DHS to certify the family composition and to assess children for unmet needs. We don't believe that these reasons justify requiring children to be present in the path. Both of these things have always been done when a family arrives at shelter. And in 2021, these reasons are even less justified. As we know, DHS has moved to conducting assessments remotely and the needs of children and families have been met effectively and safely since then. The truth is that the needs of children are best met by being in school, being in childcare, or in similar environments, not at PATH. And after the academic and social distancing that children have gone through, we cannot revert to pre-pandemic practices that disrupted relationships and routines and that forced children to miss school. The current exemption of children from PATH is temporary. The administration has not indicated any intention of returning to pre-pandemic practices, but they have not agreed to make them permanent either. That's why we ask you to support intro 1829 and allow it to pass. This would make the current practice permanent and will protect children who experience homelessness in the future from a harmful and archaic administrative requirement. I'd also like to add that when strongly supports intro 2405, so that youth can access city caps without entering DHS shelter. We'd like to thank Chair Levin for his leadership in ensuring that the understanding that we all had years ago with regard to fair and streamlined access to city FEPS is actually implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josefa. Thank you, Josefa, for your testimony. And thank you, Chair Levin. At this point, we have now heard from everyone who signed up to testify today. We appreciate all of your time and presence. If we inadvertently missed anyone who would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and I will call on you in the order in which your hands are raised. Okay. Seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Levin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you so much, Council Pillowan, um, to all the staff uh, in the hearing today, committee staff, our sergeants at arms um, and my colleagues, Councilmember Diaz. Um, thank you, and um, to my other colleagues that had legislation, Councilmember Ayala, um, uh, in this package today. Um, and we hope that that we can get these bills passed into law. We have, um, you know, we have a, 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 sh a short time frame to do it, um, but this is important and. Um, uh, I think the testimony um, uh, from the young people who have had lived experience, um, uh, from Jamie and John um, detailing um, and clear data um, exactly what uh, what happens to young people when they age out of the, the, uh, the DYCD system. Um, it's really incumbent upon us to do something here and to pass this legislation. So um, I want to thank you all and look forward to working with you and, and let's let's get this done. With that, this hearing is adjourned.